And then what I'm going to talk about today is Empiris, which is a software company I started after um, leaving Synopsys. As, as Mike says, my background was in EDA and design technology for chips. And what we've really done is looked at the way software has changed and said, okay, we need to try and understand how we verified and, and built systems to help you get quality chips out and try and do the same for software. What I'm going to do, uh, talk a little bit about the background and how we see the, the changing needs of uh, embedded software development. And it's interesting, we've talked a lot, I mean, people have talked today about, about different things of the agile testing, static analysis, there's one about assertions data. And we are focused really on um, dynamic uh, simulation, dynamic testing. But what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the background and the challenges and then also the traditional approach and then get on to what it is that, that we focus on. Let's try and get rid of this pointer. And, uh, and then give an example of what a, a customer used our technology and what they found and how it worked from their embedded software point of view. So hardware is changing. This is an example from a mobile chip, not, not sort of ultra modern, but uh, maybe last generation, a TI one. What it has is it has several processing elements in it. Top left, you've got SMP cores. That's a, a dual A15, uh, ARM A15 in there. There's a couple of other cores, we've got asynchronous, um, asymmetrically running, there's Cortex, a couple of M4s, and then there's some hardware accelerators in there, which actually some of those are processes, which may be doing image stuff or analysis or, or some processing. So you've got many concurrent processes running software effectively, all in the same thing. So, and that's just an example, there's the same in servers, the same in all sorts of different uh, systems. And basically multi-core is going into everything. It's in most things now. If it's not, it's going to be. And there can be different configurations from asymmetric, where they're the same processes. Uh, sorry, symmetric, where they're the same processes sharing memory. Um, asymmetric, when they're not, maybe there's communication and then accelerate. So there's all sorts of different challenges from a hardware point of view. And from a software point of view, we basically have layers and layers of software. And we might think, okay, we're in the embedded world. Actually, it's relatively simple. It's not pretty much a lot of industrial control, a lot of consumer products. It's all going to end up with similar sort of layers of complexity of of the stack going up to, you know, here's an example to an Android framework where you're going to, the user interface is going to be Android. But, but sitting down below it, you've actually got quite a lot of complexity dealing with the hardware. It's not just pure, just software applications. There's a lot of layers of software talking to the hardware. And the challenge you get is you get interactions from the different cores. Sure, you've got shared memories and devices. Maybe in certain um, secure modes, you can access a, a peripheral, and in a non secure mode, you can't, or the other way around. So there's a lot of complexity there. And maybe you've got libraries that are coming in from a hardware point of view, where there's silicon IP blocks and stuff like that. So there's a lot of challenges in the hardware that need validating, but also in the software. And what we see is the software that sits nearest to the processor actually can have a lot of complexity in it, which is masked by different things. And so often the bugs that you find are actually often in the corner cases, and they can be very buried and appear elsewhere. And often you find them well after development's finished. And that's one of the biggest challenges. We saw an example of rockets and car crashes and things like that where uh, bugs in the software aren't detected until far too late. And that's obviously one of the challenges that we all face in software is how we can solve that um, type of problem. Um, traditionally, how do we develop software? Well, we might get a breadboard, might get some hardware. We might have limited availability of that. We don't have access to them. That was a comment from people in the uh, PlayStation. We maybe got 10 to access, and they schedule tasks uh, to run on the things. Um, often, one of the challenges we see for a complex design is late in arrival. You don't actually don't get the hardware until way too late in the process. And that's often challenges the whole problem of getting to market fast. You can't wait for the silicon, can't wait for the test, uh, the test bed. So maybe you actually use a previous generation or try and model it some other way. Um, typically, people have a simulation models from the RTL point of view. And they might, if they're doing a complex large SOC, try and invest in a huge uh, accelerator to try and run it on. Or they might use cycle accurate uh, simulation technology. But the problem comes is you know, hardware prototypes are too late, but actually the modern verification technology they're using is very, very slow and often very hard to get up and running. And if, you, if you've got the hardware design, you've actually almost finished your RTL, and so it's always too late. Um, so those are the types of challenges. And what we're going to do is talk about how, um, how that can change or how the next generation can be done. Um, what we focus on is what's called virtual platforms. It's really simulation. No one builds a chip without simulating it anymore, and we believe that nobody should be building embedded software without simulating it. Um, and it, there are lots of challenges in building simulation technology and making it available early, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. But you know, people have shown and 
that if you simulate something, you're going to find bugs sooner. You, know, you wouldn't if you don't test it. You're not going to find the bugs. If you simulate it, you're going to find them sooner, sooner and easier. And there's a lot of benefits. Uh, you might get more powerful tooling, and that's a bit what I'm going to talk about. Um, you might be easier to replicate things. I mean, definitely the regression testing and everything is a lot more reliable and a lot simpler if you've got simulation. And also, you can provide them anywhere on the planet. You make a change today, they can have it in India or wherever you're doing software development tomorrow, you know, in, in same time zones, whatever. So there's a lot of good reasons why people are moving and becoming more efficient in using uh, virtual platforms. One of the first things is how fast does it run? Here's an example of some of our models of processors. We tend to focus on the processor in a simulation of an embedded system. Uh, because that tends to be one of the most important bits. And we have models from, I think, nine different uh, architectures, from uh, sort of smaller ones from the FPGA fabrics, the Microblades and the NEOS, all the way up to the, the MIPS and the ARM 64-bit uh, processors. And the performance and numbers are in there. These are the million of ins millions of instructions a second they run on a desktop machine. So this is a, a $1,000 uh, machine, a uh, Dell machine, running at about 3.4 gigahertz. So you can see we've got quite high performance um, as the models run. But also, we can boot Linux. And one of the reasons we're using my laptop here is I'm now just booting Linux on a simulated ARM quad core A15 on this laptop. And when it gets to the prompt, which is now, you know, I think what I have is I have an interactive environment. I can log in. I can um, show you, you know, this is an ARM processor. I know four cores. If you were to know what the features were that you worked out, that was, a, was an A15. And you can run them. Um, software very efficiently. I mean, I've got some, if I could type, a very simple ones, simple Fibonacci series. I can run software on it. I've got standard Linux type of things. And it's, it's very efficient and fast. That ran some 5 billion instructions in that time. And just to show, boot to the prompt, and I'm going to kill this window the moment it gets to the prompt. I've got to the prompt now. Let's kill it. So that took about seven seconds here with all this networking stuff going on and everything. Seven seconds. So that Linux boot, 1.8 billion instructions to that point on a quad core ARM. And uh, most of the work getting to the prompt, actually, if you look, is actually on one of the processors. Most of them are asleep up to that point. So it's, it's fast and efficient, modern technology. So it is actually adequate and appropriate for doing software development on. So that's just an example of that one. But actually, one of the challenges comes is, when a, a, you've got a design here where you've got multiple cores in your target. You're running on a, an embedded MIPS or something with maybe four cores, six cores, or you know, ARM processors. And obviously, that's going to slow things down when you simulate it. And here's an example. This is a quad-core ARM57. That's running. And you can see at the top, I have a, it's a two-core machine. But actually, being Intel, it thinks it's got two hyperthreads as well. We tend to only run on two of them. But um, shows you the, the, the performance of it. If I just do that again to show the running on a, when it start, didn't hit the button. Oh, now I've lost the performance thing, so well, it's running. So, um, and we can see there we ran on, um, uh, we were making, utilize, utilizing all of the processes. And you can see we simulated here in this test case 16 billion instructions in that short time running, running at 3.4 billion instructions a second on this machine. So we're making use of the host parallelism of the um, of a, of a, a desktop laptop. And that's very important for the future, because you want to simulate the actual software running. These virtual platforms run the real binaries. So we don't have to cross-compile them. We don't have to touch them. They just run the real uh, production binaries, because we're modeling enough of the system in enough, in, with enough accuracy that the software doesn't realize it's not running on hardware. And as you get more parallelism in the hardware, you need, your simulation technology needs to, to be able to cope with that. So you can still get the throughput. Because if you're testing at the, the, the sort of server end of, of where these processes are going, you know, you've got tens of billions of, of stri instruction streams. So you might have tests which, on a slow tool, might actually run for three or four days. So the faster you can get the simulation tools, uh, the better. Um, key thing, faster the test. The more tests run, more bugs get found, the better quality, the less time. This is very much a dynamic approach rather than a formal static approach that we saw. Um, one of the key things um, is performance. The second is you need a standardized way to model things, because everybody's got their own. Yes, you might use a standard processor, but you've got your own components, so you need a way of modeling that. Um, and 
other things are the way that the tools interact with the simulator. Simulating is, is, is necessary, but it's actually not sufficient. So we've built a lot of technology and models. We've uh, put a lot of it in open source in something called open virtual platforms, overviewworld.org, and there's some 200 um, uh, models out there. About 100 of those are CPU variants, which you saw at the chart earlier. But one of the key things is it, it, we provide an API. Magic. We provide an API which allows you to model your own platform. So you, you, we provide lots of platforms for different ARM and MIPS processes, but you can add your own components to them. And we hook to standard debuggers and things like that and provide a simulator. So that's a base. But one of the key things that's very important is that, yes, you've got to be able to simulate the platform, and we have a very fast, what's called a JIT code morphing simulator in there and stuff. But one of the key things is you need to be able to extend it, because we don't know the instrumentation that people need to do themselves. You know, whether they want to do, we have tools which do things like code coverage, but the technology we've built allows you to write C code to, to introspect a running system and see what's happening and build things. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some assertions. Um, um, so in terms of debug, we think of debug in terms of uh, uh, three different sort of steps to it. A traditional debug we call one dimensional, first dimensional, where you've got GDB-like trace, uh, register changes, looking at source lines and things. And that's okay for sort of simple programs, but very hard when you've got a billion lines of uh, Linux booting. Um, you can look at variables, look at source, single set, maybe there's a good GUI to it. We call that first dimension. Second dimension becomes very important for a multi... The second thing is we call a 2D uh, debug. When you've got a, uh, a multi-core system, where you've got lots of processes, it's no good just having one debugger looking at one, another debugger looking at another, and if you've got eight processes, you actually can't... It's hard enough to cope with a debugger with one set of windows for one processor, but eight, eight debuggers and stuff you just can't do. So you need to have some technology which allows you to look across the chip and see what's going on and set breakpoints related to things and everything like that. So you need to, well, something that's spatially aware. But also, as things get more complex, there's a temporal nature, a time nature in there. So, for example, if you're debugging a driver that's talking to a peripheral, a UART or something, you want to say, well, when an interrupt service routine happens after this has happened in some other device and this has happened, that's when I want to stop the system and have a look at it. So there needs to be some uh, sequential nature to the, the notion of debugging. So that's sort of, you know, at some point it will magically switch and we'll be in sync. So the third dimension is, is the idea of layer aware. Because when you're developing a system, you might, if you're building models, you might need to look at the source. If you're doing it low-level software, you might want to see what's going on in the specific processor. You've got the drivers. You've got all of these different things. And as I said, you know, a billion of instructions going into uh, running Linux. You want to be looking at it. So uh, layer aware, and this is just an example of some of the, the tools that we have. So down at the low level, uh, um, you know, the simulator you've got specific low level GDB level stuff. But in the processor, we can look at all sorts of different things in the process that, that the software uh, debugger might not see to do with what's going on in terms of the TLB, physical to virtual address mapping, the types of things. I mean, you know, that SMP arm, well, the 57, something like 17 address uh, translation technologies in there. So there's a lot of complexity in a modern processor. So if you're down at the processor level, you need stuff which understands it. And as you move up, you might want technology which does things more on the software side of things. And actually, we have all sorts of different things built into the technology, which does non-intrusive line coverage, profiling, and analysis like that, heat, uh, heat and stack checks, mallet checks, all built into the tools, and that you can extend yourself, which is non-intrusive. We do not change the binary of the software. We do not change the model. It's built into the the smart simulation technology we've got. And we have, for example, when you're booting Linux, you can watch how Linux boots by watching the print case or the scheduler and, and see what's happening. So we don't, we don't need to be down at the level of um, uh, the low-level processor. Um, and just an example here. So this is an example of how our customers, one of our customers used the technology actually during an evaluation. So this is Altera. And they had quite a complex, uh, complex SOC. They have a dual-core A9 on the left. And in the fabric of their FPGA, they actually were putting NEOS processors. So they had several requirements uh, that they wanted to test, um, because a, lo a lot of times they provide software which already runs on their platform. So they wanted to try Linux booting on a single Cortex A9, an SMP Linux boot, an RTOS booting, a dual core AMP boot with different OSs, a lot of complexity. And they wanted to run that through. And one of the technologies we've got, and it's going to be a long, long machine, um, multi-core. No. Um, one of the things we've got is some assertion technology, so it's going to be interesting to talk to the, listen to the next presentation. One of the, uh, the assertion technologies that we have is it allows you to extend it, really, so that you can actually define a re region of memory and say, okay, only this processor can access that region of memory. Maybe it's a peripheral address or something. So we can watch the, uh, the memory and see who's talking to it 
and define in a simple table who's allowed to talk to it. And actually, this found several bugs. And you get information out about physical addresses and virtual addresses. So and that's a very simple assertion uh, that we have. And actually, the customer, what they found is several bugs that they didn't know were there. They were already shipping this. Their customers were using it. So they had bugs in the, in the standard Linux. They had bugs in this RTOS. They had bugs when they had the AMP thing. So this is systems that they thought were up and running and working, but there's latent problems in it. And sort of worrying, we don't, you don't know when you're done, but more verification technology you can put in, the faster you can do verification, the more bugs you're likely to find, which is obviously the goal in a lot of this. So I think the key message I have is that simulation is necessary for the next generation of embedded software, but it's not sufficient. And the faster the simulator is, the corollary is. The, simula the faster the simulation is, the better uh, it is, because you're going to find more, uh, more bugs. And of course, for multi-core systems, you need to run on multi-core platforms to get performance. Um, the technology allows you to have this layer aware, so you can only see things you're interested in. You know, if you've got you know, a billion lines of code, you don't want to be tracing that. But a thousand functions is a bit better. And subsystems and processes running it is a lot easier. And part of the technology allows you to extend um, so you can build your own, because we don't know all the solutions that actually people need, so we have this ability to extend it. Um, so Conclusion, I think, is it's inevitable that simulation is going to form a key part of the next generation of software development methodology. It's interesting. I thought that about 10 years ago, and I said I've come to do it. Five years ago, we reached that. But actually, it's beginning to start now with, with most processor vendors provide a software environment, but more and more, most complex chips are now coming with a software development environment. But having just a simple simulator and a debugger isn't enough. There needs to be much more complexity to it. And we believe that not only do you need the sort of the two or 3D verification, the layer aware and stuff, you need to, to be able to extend it as well. Um, and to find the most complex bugs, you need to be able to add your own technology to find it in the specific you know, market setting that you're in. Um, so, thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Questions? Okay, then. So how do you handle you know, modeling of complex peripherals and buses and all that kind of thing in this, yeah. this kind of environment? Yeah, so the question of modeling is a very difficult one. I mean, there's two areas. One is three areas, probably. One is how accurate you make the model and how you verify it and whether the, the, the tests are even available for it. So our approach is that we provide the infrastructure to allow people to model the, the stuff themselves. Previous generations of technology said, you, we'll build it for you under contract. Our approach is not a service business, it's a tool provider, and we provide this. We provide examples of about 100 different behavioral components that we or our partners or our customers have built. Some are very simple, just sort of um, register accurate, and actually typically Linux, Linux will boot. If you've got the USB address and you've got the registers there, it'll boot. You actually don't need the functionality. Same with Ethernet and CAN and everything else. So some of the models are very simple to build, and they're just register accurate. The challenge comes where you want to test something which has real Ethernet, and you're testing that and everything. And we provide a level of models. We provide technology so you could do it yourself. We have service providers that can build models for you. But we actually provide ones for things like Ethernet. And we provide two. One's a simple register, one which does nothing. Another one which actually talks to the real hardware so that you can actually, sitting in your simulated, uh, running on an ARM or net web browser, go to the Ethernet, talk to the real Ethernet, talk to other boards, or talk to the web, whatever. So our modeling technology, we provide modeling technology, we provide example models from simplest to quite complex, and we allow you to do them yourself. But it is one of the challenges. How do I get a model of my piece of IP? Yeah. So if I understand that right, then you're saying that um, you've essentially got a hybrid where you've got a simulator for the, the CPU, and then you're actually somehow hooking it up to real Ethernet Max and you know all that kind of we thing. Can't, we, yes, I mean, so we provide a simulation infrastructure which you can build models, those models can be CPUs, behavioral components, or models that talk to the real hardware, the virtualization. We provide a library of the CPU models and the behavioral ones, and you can do your own. So, that, so it is a, a hybrid, yes. But there are several standard platforms we provide for an ARM-based system, or a Linux-based system, or which will boot Linux and boot other OSs. There's about seven OSs that we've tested through this that customers have used. So the chances are that you'll be, be able to find most of the components and something will work, it may be your specific own IP, if you're building hardware, might need modeling. But it's not that hard to do if you know how the hardware works. Okay, okay thank you very much, Simon. Okay. Thank you.